We are starting. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Back from two weeks ago, it seems like it's been forever since we had last class. We're in the middle of the cost of discipleship parable in Luke chapter 14. I say the middle. I actually just got started here two weeks ago, so I think what we're going to do is start at the beginning and fly through the first few couple of pages, and then we'll pick up where we were just so we can come to the step once again. But let's pray and we'll start to fly. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us. Father, I pray that your spirit is with us tonight as we study these parables. Help us, Father, to learn the lessons you want us to know. Thank you for helping us gain your insight. We thank you for your wisdom. And we just pray that you guide us this evening to go as far as you want us to, to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I think all of you are here two weeks ago except Teresa. I wasn't sure if Alice and Chief would be here tonight or not. So I wasn't sure how much we needed to review. But if you remember this parable, this is Luke chapter 14. We just covered the parable of the banquet, the parable of the feast. And Jesus is still hanging around that general setting there. And he says this, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Or if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war with another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? And if he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. And so we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. We looked at the idea that this parable really talks about. Whoops, and I didn't take my freaking thing into my computer. See, gone two weeks and I already forgot how to make this terrible. Sorry. The parable really is talking about we need to calculate the cost of being a disciple of Jesus. And we spent a lot of time two weeks ago talking about that topic. And really the question is what it came up have any of us really ever done that? Have we really ever stopped? Did, first of all, did you do it before you became a Christian? Did you ever sit around with someone and have them explain to you, if you're going to be a child of God, here's what it's going to take. Here's what you're going to need to do. Here's how your life may need to change. And whether you did or not then, have we done that later? Have we somewhere in our Christian walk spent some time really thinking about, what does it cost me? be a child of God. We touched on this in our Sunday night small group and being the weirdo that I am I flipped the question and thought, you know, one of the things that cost me is I don't have to worry about being caught doing things I shouldn't be doing. You know, I looked at it from the positive side. You know, I, I was able to and you know say, I, I some things I used to do before I really got committed to Christ that I don't do anymore and I don't have to worry about getting caught. I don't have to worry about the consequences of those. So we, we talked about that some, but Jesus isn't talking about that. Jesus is talking about what good things do you necessarily or potentially have to give up, and what are the consequences to your life because you're going to be a follower of Jesus. I submit very few of us had that discussion before we became a Christian. I think I told John even today, I don't remember ever doing a sermon on this parable. I don't remember ever really hearing a lesson on this parable before. It's just something we don't like to think about. And I don't know why, because Jesus makes it pretty clear. You need to calculate what following me is going to cost you before you make your mind up. Because you can, you, can, can you really honestly calculate that cost without having done it? I don't think you totally can. Certainly things will come up in our life as we become a Christian and move into circumstances. I don't think you can fully understand what is this going to cost me. Any more than, you know, if you're a parent, you're thinking, what's it going to be like to be a mom or a dad? And until you really have a kid, you can talk about it your whole life. But and until you get one, you never, you're never going to know. Things change, circumstances. It appears to be a serious cost. Yes. 
Oh, absolutely. I think that's Jesus' point throughout the whole gospel. You may think you're giving up something for me, but what you end up receiving far exceeds anything you're ever going to give up. And certainly that's and that mindset we need to have. But at least in this parable, Jesus says you need to think about what's it going to cost you. And he's living in a circumstance most of us weren't in. These Jews, if they decided to follow Jesus, they got kicked out of the synagogue. We've seen some of that already. We've watched some of the stories that we've looked at that these people rejected those who accepted Jesus Christ. And I think in a sense, Jesus is trying to tell them that. This is not going to be easy. You know, and back in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about how you're going to be persecuted. You're going to have some consequences. And somebody told me yesterday after we baptized Mike that he went up to him after services and said, I just want to warn you, Satan's going to come after you now. Your life is going to be challenged. Your decision to want to really be a child of God is going to be attacked. And I told that person, thank you for telling me that. You know, because we need to be reminded when we really want to do what God wants us to do, Satan comes right along and says, let me give you a hard time. Let me change your mind. Let me show you some things that aren't going to work uh, so that we can wonder about it. We use one of, the, one of the parables later on here, and they talk about giving it to the wealthy, basically about giving up all your money and give it to give it off to the poor and so on, and you become like them type yep. of thing. Well, that's, 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 that's what work is day and day. Yeah. <laughs> Things will change throughout the years and, and your walk with Jesus, but there's a basic when you go get when you put your faith in Christ and be baptized, you come out and, and and you're living for Christ now. So you should know what that entails up front. I think we do a disservice. I think most of us preachers and most people who teach people about Jesus do a disservice. You know, the Matthew twenty eight passage we looked at Sunday morning. Go into all the world and make disciples. It does not start with go into all the world and get people baptized. Go into all the world and make people feel good about Jesus. I think our trouble is we don't understand what a disciple is. A disciple is a follower. A disciple is someone who is willing to be disciplined, that's where that word comes from, by the master, the rabbi. And, of course, the people in the days of Jesus knew exactly what that meant. 
because they had teachers that traveled all over the place, and they would get people who would follow them and go along with what they were teaching, and they would come and become their disciple, and they would trek after them, they would go around with them, they'd do whatever they needed to do, and they would try to live the way their rabbi was telling them to live. I don't think we do a very good job of that most of the time. I think we've got this God that, hey, if you'll just accept Jesus as your Savior, your life will be better. Uh, you won't have any troubles. Uh, God will always be with you. He'll answer all your prayers. We've got this positiveness, which all of that can be true. But Jesus isn't talking about that in this parable. He's talking about, you really need to sit down and figure out, what's it going to cost you to follow me? And again, I think this is different back in those days, as Paul's always reminding us. Because most of us who, I say that in a blanket way, most of us who are Christians don't give up much of anything except Sunday morning sleep in. You know, and we just, that's my sacrifice. I get up to come to a building on Sunday when I can sleep in. What more does God expect from me? <laughs> that's so simple. You know, who just show up on Sunday and think, I'll check the box. I'm, I've done well. I don't think Jesus is satisfied with that. And the challenge, of course, the, the, the setting, the context that again we looked at, Jesus has just gone through those parables about the wedding, about the wedding feast and the banquet, and he's made it pretty clear to the Pharisees and the religious leaders who were there, uh, you're the ones that don't get to go in. You're the very ones we're talking about who rejected the invitation. And because you rejected it, all these people who are outside are going to be invited in. They're going to get to come in, but you're not going to get to. And then the very next verse says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. He's got a lot of people that love to hear what he says. I mean, there's some sense of, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but isn't it fun to watch somebody, karma, I guess, the car that goes flying by you on the interstate, right behind you is that police car, you're not the market car. You know, he just turns the lights on. Or somebody's cutting you off, weaving through traffic, and you're thinking, where's the cops when you need them? And one suddenly pulls out, pulls that guy over. Don't you, when you pass that guy on the interstate, feel sort of smug about it? Sort of, you got yours. And the Bible doesn't say this, but I suspect some of these people who are following Jesus are sick and tired of the Pharisees pointing fingers at them and making them feel bad and telling them they're not good enough. We don't want you. You're not us. And I'm guessing some of those people walked around with Jesus waiting for the next blast against the Pharisees because they enjoyed hearing it. So they're following him. And Jesus, this next parable is addressed to them. He's not talking to the Pharisees anymore. He's talking to this large crowd of people who are just following around after him. Remember the one where he feeds all the thousands and, and then he stops feeding them and what happens? They leave. They, leave. they walk away. If you're not going to feed us, we're not coming. And Jesus turns to the other twelve and says, are you going to leave me too? I mean, where'd everybody go? I think that's where we're at here. We've got a bunch of people who are tagging along, they're showing up on church on Sunday, thinking, well, this sounds good, it makes me feel good, let's just see what this man's going to do next. We like the miracle, this is cool, this is better than the circus, and they're going along for the show. That's the people Jesus is talking to. So this isn't all about fun and game stuff. There are consequences to this decision. You need to consciously think about what you're going to do if you're going to be a child of God. Because you're going to hate your mother and father. That sounds pretty nasty, really. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago about the idiom, right? Where it's an English term, it's using words that don't mean really what they say, but the point gets across. He's obviously saying, I got to be first. And if some of these people, they lose their mothers and fathers. They lose their families because they become followers of Christ. The Jews say, We don't want you anymore. And really, what he's saying is, there's going to come a time you're going to have to decide. Is it mom and dad and the comfortableness of the old law Moses stuff? Are you willing to give all that up to follow me? Sometimes it's the mother and father that say that. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's mom and dad who accept Jesus and the kids won't follow. The mom and dad. 
you know, my criminal client who broke into somebody's house to steal stuff. You know, maybe he was just hungry. <laughs> maybe he hadn't had anything to eat for like a month, and, and he was just starving. You know, you can always come up with stories of how to avoid what God wants you to do. They did that with Jesus, didn't they? Remember, many, many times Jesus was teaching, and somebody would come up and ask a question. And the question was almost always, many times the verse will say, they did that to trap him. But other times they did it just because they were trying to avoid the truth. The rich young ruler guy. You know, what do I need to do? Well, you need to do this, 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 this. I've done all of that. And that's your still. That's the guy Jesus said, we'll sell all you got. You know, and he went away sorrowful because he had a lot. The other story that we'll get to down the road here next week or the week after or the week after or the week after. <laughs> Actually, I think we've already done this one. Now, who's my neighbor? Right? The, the Good Samaritan story. Jesus laid it all out there, and this mud guy, well, just who is my neighbor? And Jesus lays it out for you. Don't we do that sometimes with God? You know, God, you want me to do this, but, you know, but who am I supposed to do this to? You know, how am I supposed to do that? What happens if I don't? And we want to argue with God about what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And believe me, I do the same thing. All right? I do. Don't ever put your minister up on a pedestal because I got the same problems you got. You know, I argue with God. God, how come we have to do it this way? Why can't we do it that way? This doesn't make any sense to me. As much as I know about the Bible, there's still parts of it that make no sense to me in certain circumstances. How does this work now? How do we talk to the guy who can't get the fence right? How do we bring out a Christian attitude to this guy who's clearly being incompetent and not doing, not fulfilling his promises the way he's supposed to? How does my Christ-like attitude come to this? I mean, these everyday things that are going on in our lives that aren't that easy. And sometimes one of the things we have to give up, one of the costs that we have to bear, is you got to take that kind of garbage in a Christ-like way. I mean, how many of us would love, and I'm not just taking on your fence guy, but we've all had people who were supposed to come do something at our house, didn't show up, they did it wrong, whatever the situation was. You wanted to scream and yell, didn't you? I mean, you just wanted to blast this guy with both barrels. And some of us did sometimes. But Jesus says, that's not the way I want you living. If you're going to follow me, you got to love your enemies. Those people who hate you, those people who don't want good things for you, you got to love them. Excuse me? You know, how is that supposed to work? And, and so it isn't easy. But Jesus has this mob of people who are following him. And again, I think they're just following for the fun of it. They're watching the miracles. They're getting fed. They want somebody to give them something. And Jesus turns to them and says, let me tell you up front. If you're going to follow me, there's a cost to it. And you watch as the crowds slowly dwindle away. So by the time he's hanging on that cross, there's only two or three people hanging there with him. You know, Mary's there, John's there, two or three other women. But the mob, the crowd, they fled to who knows where because they weren't going to pay that price. And so I think that's, you know, that's what Jesus is, is addressing this next parable to for these people who think, I'm just going to follow Jesus as long as it's easy, as long as it's comfortable, as long as I don't have to do anything more than get up on Sunday. And then sure, I'm in, unless I want to say good on Sunday, then, then I'll miss that one. But for the most part, I'm in. And I think those are the people Jesus is talking to. John. And we have taught that, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because we've not taught this. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. We, we've ignored this, and by our silence, have sort of adopted the idea that, you know, being a Christian is easy. There's nothing to this. Just show up on Sunday and don't steal stuff. <laughs> and if you do steal stuff, feel bad about it and give it back. You know, we, <laughs> well, you got to come to all the potlucks. Well, you have to come to the potlucks. I mean, you have to do that because it's a sin not to come to the potlucks. And we can come to those, you know, everybody comes up. We got a bunch of people in here for potluck, don't we? And I'm glad we do. But they're just, you know, 
are those people like Jesus. That they're looking for the food. They're looking to eat. They're looking for the fun stuff. But we don't do anything bad. Uh, we looked at the medium. We talked about that already. Well, can you go just I have a question. One more. This one? Yeah, 27. What does that mean, whoever does not carry their cross? We're going to talk about that. We're going to get to that. Okay, my bad. Sorry. But let's talk about it now. What, is, what are you talking about? <laughs> what is she talking about? I didn't mean to rest you. That's okay. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean to carry your cross. You mean to carry your own faults, your issue? I don't know. I don't know what it means. It means take whatever the burden is you have to carry and carry. In other words, Jesus had a cross to carry, didn't he? Jesus carried his cross to Calvary. I think what Jesus is saying is when these bad things times come, remember that? I always look at the context. You may have to hate your mother and father. You may have to hate your wife and children, brothers and sisters, even your own life. That's the cross he's talking about. When these things come into your life and you've got to make a choice, am I going to follow Jesus or am I going to give in to whatever all these pressures are? Your cross is to follow Jesus. you got to carry your cross. you got to pick it up and go with it. You can't just ignore the truth and decide, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to continue to accept mom and dad. Yeah, they don't follow Jesus. They want me to live by the Old Testament law. I'll go to the temple and sacrifice a, a goat you know, or a lamb or something just to stay in good with mom and dad. Jesus, I think, is saying whatever it's going to cost you, and it cost him a cross, right? Whatever it's going to cost you, you've got to be willing to carry it. You've got to be willing to do it. You've got to be willing to say, if it costs me losing mom and dad, then that's a cross I'll carry. Does that make sense? I think that's what he's saying. As you look at that context of what he's saying, that cross is whatever you have to bear in order to follow me is what you have to bear. You've got to pick up your cross. I have to be number one. There are. Yeah, do it. Nothing else. Nothing else. Just do it. It doesn't mean you can't have everything else. Yeah, it doesn't mean you have to hate your mom and dad. He's putting this in the context of what's it going to cost. Remember? And that's what the world is parable in a minute. This is the setting of the parable. He's saying you've got to count the cost. It's going to cost you something. And it's whatever it's going to cost you, that's the cost you're going to have to bear. That's the consequence for following me. And then he gives us the parable. You know, who goes to war without counting the cost? Who wants to build a house without trying to figure out if having enough money to finish the thing or not? That's the parable he gives in, in response to this. What am I willing to pay in order to follow Jesus? And Jesus says, when it comes down to it, you either got to be willing to do it. Or how does it end? You cannot be my disciple. If you're not willing to put me first in your life, you can't be my disciple. That's tough. I mean, that's really tough. Jesus. Yeah, that too. But isn't it also that doing that as well, but... Um, it's not going to be pleasant because you can be persecuted. It's not going to be a pleasant life, not just because of that, what you're saying. You oh, sure. You have to give up your yes. mom The persecution may be the cross you have to bear. Yeah. And he says that in other, in other places. That, But that persecution could come from anybody. It could come from your family members. Absolutely. It could come from yeah. co-workers. Sure. The government. It can come from anybody. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Not just immediate family problems. Whatever your cross is, wherever it comes from, you either have to bear under it. Or you can't be my disciple. That's a tough sentence. You either do it my way, or you don't get to do it at all. My way, the highway. I think that's why I asked, because I'm reading that last part, cannot be my disciple. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I need to know what this means. Whoever does not carry their cross. Yeah. Because I need to be able to do that. I wasn't concerned about the second part. Well, yeah, it's, it's the way that it ends. Yeah. You can't be. It's not. You'll have a hard time being. No, you just can't. It's not, it'll be haphazard. It's, you cannot be my disciple if you're not willing to pay whatever the price it is to follow me. doesn't mean you have to give up mom and dad. You may have Christian parents. You know, you may never deal with somebody in your immediate family who's giving you a hard time being a Christian. It may be a co-worker. You may be in a country where it's the government. Who knows what it is? But whatever it is Jesus said, you got to be willing to, to take it. You've got to be willing to do that. Oh, you can't be my disciple. 
it, it also says you will have a cross. It doesn't say if. That's right. It says their cross. Yes. So there is not a question mark will you have one or not. There's something you're Everybody's got one. Well, that's yes. the thing. We, we talk about in Hebrews, too. That's, that means pretty much all of Hebrews is about line 27. Yes, it is. You know, I mean, really, yeah. honestly, yeah. that's a good wrap-up yeah. for that. I'm going to have to remember that for Tuesday but because we're going into 11. But it's, it's exactly that right there. It is. You know, mm-hmm. because these Jewish Christians are struggling with the fact that they're being persecuted um, kids are being bullied at school. Mm-hmm. All this stuff is going on, and they're like, "Man, if I just go back to the synagogue, all this stops." That's right. You cannot be a disciple of Christ if you do that. That's right. And that, I mean, and I think that's what the Hebrew writer is trying to tell him: you're losing everything by making this very poor decision to not bear your cross. If you're part of those that shrink back, yeah, you're in big trouble. And if we want to bring that to today. We see a lot of Christians today who want to take the cultural climate and say it's okay to be homosexual. Yeah. It's okay to be whatever. It's okay to be Hindu. It's okay to be Muslim. It's okay to be whatever you want to be because we're all going to the same place anyway. Jesus, I think, is saying you can't allow that to be taught and go on. You can't allow the sinfulness of this world to be accepted in my church, in God's church. Because if you do, you're not carrying your cross. You're not standing up for the truth, which is what happens. That's why you lose your mom and dad and all this other stuff, is because you're standing up for what's right. If you're not going to do that, Jesus is saying you can't be my disciple. Have you ever thought about it that way? Well, those are false taught then, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the piece. That's, I mean, that'd be difficult if you had a good friend that is Hindu or whatever. Or now, I'm not uh, saying you can't have friends. That no, are I'm Hindu. just saying, but then you, if you get this conversation. Yes. And they want to say, well, we're all going to the same place. Yeah. You're like, and you don't say anything. Really? Yeah. You know, probably not, didn't. The boldness says, we need to talk about that. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, well, you're just flat out wrong. You're going to hell. Yeah. That, that's not the answer. Yeah. It's, can we talk about that? And see if they'll talk with you. Susan Gibson shared in a Bible class, so I don't think there's anything wrong by saying it again. She had some Jewish friends at her knitting place, a quilting place, one of those places. And they knew she was a Christian. And one day, one of her Jewish friends said to her, so you think because I'm not a Christian, I'm Jewish, I'm going to hell? (laughs) She didn't know what to say. But see, that's the time we either bear that cross and say, we need to talk about that because you need to know what the Bible says. And the Bible says this. Jesus is the only way to the Father. And if you don't have Jesus... We need the boldness to do that. And boy, that's not easy. And I'm not saying every Muslim you see and every Hindu you see and every atheist you see, you need to beat them over the head of the Bible and say, you're living wrong, you're going to hell. But if you've got a friend who's Hindu and you spend your whole life with them and never once share with them Jesus, you just let them be whatever they want to be and it's okay and we're just going to love on you anyway and never once bring up can we talk about the Bible some more long? Can we talk about Jesus? Can we just have a conversation about why we believe what we believe? Are you really being fair to those people? You're sort of by your silence saying, yeah, it's okay, but you have to have a good care. Are you really friends with them if you really care about them? Well, you can be friends, I think, but the question is, do you care enough to, to be honest? Well, you're doing them an injustice because no you one may have ever talked to them about it. You may be the only person in their life that God will yeah. have in their life. The only Christian they'll ever know at all, close, and you don't do it. I, I've shared before a song we used to sing in the Church of Christ. He said, you never mentioned him to me. It's the name of the song. And it, the, the verses are, when in this better land before the bar we stand, how deeply grieved my soul would be if someone... I forget how it goes to say, but maybe someone I knew that I saw from day to day said, you never mentioned God to me. Can you imagine? They're standing before eternity. You're standing over here. You've already got your gold pass. And you're just waiting to go in. And here's someone you've known for 20 years. And they stand up before the gate and God says, sorry. Imagine them turning to you 
and say, why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? That just is a horrible song. I hate that song. Because it just makes it quite clear. If you have a chance to say something and you never do, those people go to hell. They have a right to look at you and say, why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? You, you saw me every day almost and never said a word. That's part of that cross. Jesus says, go into the world make disciples. And if I'm not going to share the gospel, I'm not being fair to the people I call a friend. Because the greatest thing you can do is tell them about Jesus. Now, they don't have to listen. They, many of them won't listen. Many of them will say, well, you got what you want to do, I got what I want to do, we're all going to the same place anyway. If you've tried, you pass that bar. <laughs> you don't have to worry about them someday saying, well, you have to mention Jesus to me. You can say, uh, I did four times. You didn't accept it. But that, that would be tough, I would think. And, and all of us are guilty of that, I think, of not sharing Christ with people we know when we've had an opportunity to do it. And we just let those opportunities so. That's part of that, I think. Being a, being a disciple, following Christ, being willing to carry whatever God asks you to carry, as imperfect as we are. And we all are. And please don't leave this class tonight thinking, well, you know, I used to know somebody 30 years ago, I never mentioned about Jesus to them, now they died. It's all my fault. God's grace is awesome. All right? He isn't going to hold you accountable for something you did or didn't do 30 years ago that you repented of and said, you know, I, I'm sorry for that. The blood of Jesus, what's, what's Romans 8, 1 say? Therefore, there is there no, no condemnation. condemnation. No, right. So please don't pick up some burden and put it on your back and carry it the rest of your life because you never told so and so about Jesus. Start today. Look at it from today and go forward today. And when you have those opportunities and you're sharing something good with a friend, invite the church. I mean, that may be the easiest thing you can do. Even if they don't go to church, even if they go to some other church. I'm all in favor of, and I've done this, go to church with them. If, if you want to go to some Hindu person and say, I'd like to tell you about Jesus, would you come to church with me? And they say, well, I'll come to church with you if you'll come to the temple with me. Go. You know, if that's what it's going to take to get them to come to church, go to the temple with them once and see what happens. They're not worshiping in the Hindu temple. And again, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you don't have to do that. But I'm saying there's all kinds of ways to bring somebody into a conversation with Jesus. And if our attitude is, well, I'm going to tell you about Jesus, but I don't want to hear a word about what you've got to say, that's not very nice. I mean, that's not going to get a conversation going. You need to hear what they have to say about their God so you can compare the God you worship with their God. You'll win every time. You will win every time. There's not a single other God that these people worship that can outperform Jehovah. So don't be afraid to discuss religion with other people. The God you worship is the God. And they can tell you all they want to about all. You can turn it around every time if you know your Bible. If you know your God, they can't convince you to go follow after some false God. <coughs> but I think part of what God wants us to do is share the truth. <coughs> share the gospel with you. All right? Does that answer that for you, Teresa? More you want to say about that? It's a tough, it's a tough line. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough line. It's one of the few places Jesus actually says, if you don't do this, you cannot be my disciple. And he says, okay, in the midst of this parable that we're looking at, we've already looked at what an idiom is. So the question, I think this is about where we ended last time. We're going to get this more at this time. So is Jesus first in your life? How do we know if we are or we aren't? How do we know if he is or he isn't? And again, we touched on some of these last time. We're to love the Lord our God with all the heart, soul, strength, and mind. Right? Do we do that? Not all the time. Not, not all the time. Absolutely not all the time. Do we fail? Do we screw up?
screw it up. We make wrong choices. Uh, we get embarrassed. We miss opportunities. We don't always do this the way we should. No, but that's our goal. That's what that's we should strive for. Right. I mean, we all are right. human. I mean, and God knows it. God knows your heart. He knows if your ultimate desire is to do this. So that when you don't do it, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right? When you have an occasional slip up, an occasional failing, an occasional do something wrong, an occasion when you don't really love God the way you're supposed to, God knows your heart. He knows where you're at. He knows if your overall intent of your desire is to please him. That's where the blood of Jesus cleanses us. But if I don't care about God, if I follow God when it's comfortable, and I don't want to when it's not, I can't even begin to think I love him with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. There's just no way. And God knows that too. He knows the attitude you've got. Yeah. You know, my Bible said, like the word that previously we talked about, you know, hating your mother, your yeah. mother, and dad. So that's basically what it's, my Bible said. Is what it means is. Uh, Put Christ first. Just it. Well, that's what you're doing. Just put give Christ first. In a sense, yes, but we can make that sound real easy, can't we? Oh yeah, Christ is first. But I also do what my mom and dad want. Christ is first, but I'm going to do these other things too. Christ is first, but you can't expect me to do that. I mean, come on. Jesus says, if I'm first, all these other things fall into place. It's not. Well, I'll follow Jesus, but I'm also going to continue smoking my dope. You know, because what's the harm? It's one of those victimless crimes, right? Especially in states where it's now legal. I can do whatever I want to. I can have a mind-bending experience. If I want to, what's the big deal? Jesus wants me to feel good. That's right. <laughs> if God hadn't created that plant, I wouldn't be smoking it. So it's God's fault, right? I mean, don't we rationalize that sometimes? <laughs> you know, if God wanted me to be sexually pure, he wouldn't have made all of you women look so good. <laughs> He'd have made one for me, and that was in the end of it. I mean, it's the things I heard as a divorce lawyer <laughs> would curl your hair. I mean, some of the things supposedly Christian people would say, <laughs> we've got one of those in our church right now. Some guy who believes, not the Lord, church with this, but with the story, who's decided God's told me I need to divorce you. I don't think so. Not Jehovah God. You may have some other God you're following who may have told you that. Little G. Little G. <laughs> Jehovah God didn't say that to make you feel good. I, it's okay to divorce your wife. Satan does. Satan can say that. All kinds of things can say that. God doesn't say that. Jehovah God doesn't say that. But we blame God for everything. Really. It's all God's fault. You know, if God would have made food so tempting, I would have to make up all these things about green stuff. You know, I could eat, you know. But is I mean, that not we, true? It's all God's fault. Is that not true? Oh, yes, it is true. But that brings us to, to Teresa's question. What does it mean to carry our cross? Yeah, we want to model his sacrifice and obedience in order to be his followers. And I think the key answer is his prayer in Gethsemane, right? When Jesus is sitting there getting ready to die on a cross the next morning, and he's saying, God, don't make me do this. Take this cup away from me. If there's any way in the world I don't have to do this, I'm listening. <laughs> and I'd like to hear it. Nevertheless, not my will be first be done. That's what I really think it means ultimately to carry your cross. Is Father, not my will, but yours be done. I'm willing to do whatever your will is for my life in order to be your disciple. And again, I'm not sure we concentrate on that enough. I'm not sure we address that well enough when we're talking to people about Jesus or even now in our classes, in our congregations, in our other times. And we don't cover enough to say, am I really following Jesus or not? Or am I just going to church on Sunday thinking, oh, okay, I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't do all these other nasty things. So yeah, I'm okay. But I'm not willing to sacrifice the way Jesus sacrificed. And that's a challenge to us. I just don't think we pay enough attention to that. Paul says, and you've got this in your handout, I think. Maybe. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. In 
John says in 1 John 2, 6, whoever says I abide in him ought to walk just as he walked. There's the method. There's the cross we're supposed to carry. If I say I'm a Christian, I'm in Jesus Christ, John says that you need to live the way Jesus lived. You need to walk the way Jesus walked. you got to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Right? We used to say that many years ago. Idiom. 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 <laughs> but that's what it means, I think, to carry your cross. Am I going to live the way God wants me to live? So we've already had this question. Have we really ever stopped and calculated what it's going to cost us to be a disciple of Jesus? What is the cross he's asking you to bear? And while we can generically say the answer is easy, just to do what God wants you to do, Heather's cross isn't the same as mine. It's different, yeah. It's different. Yeah, Paul's cross is the same as Donald's. All of us have different crosses that we bear because of the lives we live, the people we come in contact with. The opportunities he gives us, the temptations Satan throws at us. Not a one of us have the exact same life where I can turn to John and say, John, here's what you need to do every time in every circumstance. I've lived in every circumstance John's going to live in. I can't possibly have an answer for everything specifically. Here's how you do this. But the general answer is, walk as Jesus walked. Try to figure it out. If this was Jesus, you know, the old WWJD bracelets that were popular, what, 25 years ago maybe? What would Jesus do? If I'm going to walk the way Jesus wants me to walk, what would Jesus do in this circumstance? That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Live the way I want you to live. So you'd be giving up the bad things in your life. That would be it. That's the first thing we should do. Give up the bad things in our life. That's the easier part for many of us. The hard part is then replacing them with the good things we're supposed to be doing. You know, I can take away, I haven't murdered anybody in a long time. <laughs> you know, and just, I haven't, you know, I can take all of, I'd be like the Pharisee that goes up to pray, right? I'm glad I'm not like that guy. I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do that, and I don't do that. Okay, but what do you do? You know, Christianity is not a list of don't do stuff. It's a list of walking the way Jesus walked. What's that mean? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Have I replaced, I don't do all those bad things with, I'm doing the right things. That's the challenge. We're studying in James. James says, to him who knows to do good, doesn't do it. To him it's a sin. So we give up all the bad stuff and never replace it with the good stuff, and we're no better off than we were before. Because we're still not doing what God calls us to do. So that's the challenge. So the question for us, for me and all of us, have I ever really sat down and calculated the cost? Do I occasionally do that? And I'd like to encourage all of us, even if we've never done it before, start thinking about it. Start asking yourself, you know, in circumstances, what is it that God would have me do in this circumstance? How am I supposed to respond to these people? How should I react if this happens? And ask God to help us. Ask for his wisdom. Again, that's what James teaches us, right? If you lack wisdom, if you don't know what to do, ask God. He'll tell you. Like the guy, the druggy guy, you know, he, God's working in his life in ways we never imagined. He's doing the same for us. If you're asking him to and seeking his wisdom, he'll give you his wisdom. And he'll help you understand what's the cost you're asking to bear. And then I believe, when you really want to do it, God will give you the power to do it. He will enable you through his spirit that lives in you to overcome these things. What's 1 Corinthians 10 13 say? Anybody know? With every temptation that's come, God has provided a way to escape. Every time you're tempted to do something wrong, God says, I've given you a way not to. You can avoid it. 1 Corinthians 10 13. It's another one of those verses I don't like. Because it's a double-edged sword. It's, yay, God, you came in a, a way of avoid this temptation. I think I didn't avoid it. I did it anyway. So now not only have I messed up by doing it, I've messed up by not taking the escape. God gave me to not do it. And so it's one of those verses that if you don't live by it, it slaps you twice. Because not only did I give in, 
I didn't avoid what I could have done to not get married. God's faithful with us. If you're trying to live the way he wants you to, he will give you the way out so you never have to sin. Isn't that amazing? That's what that verse says. You never have to sin again when you become a Christian. Because God will always give you a way to avoid the temptation that's coming. And we don't do that. We don't take the escape. And I suspect every one of us in this room tonight, when you can think of something that you've done wrong, can look at that circumstance and realize there was at least one way you could have avoided that. Many times it's probably four or five ways you could have avoided that. But in every circumstance, there's at least one way you could have avoided that. If I decided I'm going to steal John's hat, I can easily avoid that by just walking out of this room without his hat. I don't steal John's hat. But if I decide, you know, I really like John's hat, and I think just keeps going, you know, Bob, you look a whole lot better in that cap than John would. Yeah. Somewhere along the way, I'm going to give in and steal his hat. But not because I had to. But because I rejected the escape God gave me. How do you get involved? I think you'll, what you say for adults, what's there's no problem with you. You said if, if something bad happens to you, you know, then you want to, why did God do this to me? Well, the first question is, did God do it to you? You know, that's another problem we have. It's all God's fault. God did this to me. I seriously <laughs> got it. If it's a bad thing that happened to you, odds are God didn't do it to you. I mean, he didn't. Because the Bible says in Hebrews, God punishes those and disciplines those who are his children. If you're a child of God and you're wanting to do what God wants you to do and you're walking the wrong direction, there are times I believe God allows bad things to happen to you. I think those are the exceptions of the rule. Most bad things that happen to you don't happen because that was God's desire. They happen because you put yourself in a stupid place, and that's what happened. Or somebody else put themselves in a stupid place, and you happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. There's all kinds of reasons bad things happen to us. Rarely is the reason, I submit, that God did it to you. I don't think God goes around looking for bad things to do to his people. You know, God is a father to us, right? We don't look around at our kids and say, how can I hurt them today? I really want to watch them cry. I mean, would you ever do that to your kids, Teresa? It'd be yeah. good for them. Huh? It'd be good for them. It'd be good for them. They need to be toughened up. My kid's a pansy. Yeah. I think I'll beat on him a while. Good parents don't do that. God doesn't do anything. God's not walking around thinking, how can I ruin your day? But God does love us enough. How many of us with kids ever spanked your kids? Ever spanked your grandkids? I love spanking my grandkids. But God sometimes has to spank us. That's what the Hebrew letter says. Those he loves, he chases. And if you're going off in the wrong direction, you're doing everything wrong you want to do, and nothing contrary ever happens in your life, you're probably not saved to begin with. Because if you are, God's going to do something to get your attention. And you won't like it. Well, you may get just these little things, and you just didn't notice it. Absolutely. You know, and, and you just kept going. And I now he's got to get. Now he has to hit you in the head. Right? I, I believe that's what he does. Just like we do with our kids or grandkids. I'm telling you, don't do that. If you do that, you're going to get in trouble. I'm going to take my belt off. Don't make me come up there. I mean, you give them warning after warning until finally. Hey, I guess if that's what you want, it's thinking time, or however you discipline your children, you know, put them in time out, do whatever you do. I think God's the same way. Absolutely. God comes along. Look at the children of Israel. They were God's chosen people, and he would come along, they'd mess up, and he would give them hints. He'd give them warnings. He'd send a prophet and tell these people to straighten up until finally they were so far gone that he'd send the Assyrians. He'd send... The Babylonian. Somewhere along the way, he finally said, enough's enough. I'm taking my belt off. And they got it. But I agree with you. He gave them warning after warning after warning. I think God does the same thing to us. 
He warns us over and over and over, beginning with the Bible. Read the book. You know, see what it says you're supposed to do or not do. And then he gives people in your life, oh, don't do that. You know, let's go somewhere. Let's not go to the bar and drink all night. Let's go somewhere. Let's go to a movie instead. But he goes, nah, I want to go get some booze. I want to go down here to whatever that, Mousies. You know, and just sit there and drink until 1 o'clock in the morning. Don't do that. Well, at least get a designated driver. Ah, you know, my liquor. You know, over and over, God's giving you chance after chance after chance. Don't go down there and get drunk and drive home and have a wreck. You don't listen. Even at the very end, the bartender says, I'll call you a cab. Oh, I just live eight miles down the road. Another chance. Don't do this. And then have a wreck. Kill somebody. Or kill yourself. God gave you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Don't do this. It's kind of like the guy on top of his roof in the exactly. flood. Yeah. That, you know, God saved me, and he sends a boat with somebody in it. He says, no, I'm yeah. good. Yeah. I'm, God's, God's going to save me. me. Then a raft, then a helicopter, yeah. and then he dies yeah. because, he yeah. Dies. yeah. Yeah. Well, there's that story. He stands up in heaven and says, hey, God, I prayed for salvation, and you let me drown. Uh, I sent you a boat. I sent you a raft, I sent you an helicopter. What more do I have to do to save you? And like an idiot, you stayed on the roof. Yeah. But God is faithful. And when people say, well, why did God do that? My first answer is, how do you know God did that? You don't know if I did that. And I don't believe God did that. God doesn't do evil things just to ruin your day. He loves us too much for that. But he occasionally has bad things happen in your life because you won't listen. And you haven't listened to the first two or three or four warnings, and so he had to get serious. Just like the Jews, they wouldn't listen to the prophets, they wouldn't listen to the people that would say, Stop doing this, we need to do it right. And so finally he sends, you know, if you read the book of Judges, he sends all kinds of little bad guys to conquer them for a while. God raises up another judge, saves them all, and they're right back where they were. Until finally, Bad enough, he sends the Assyrians who wipes out the top ten tribes. Then he sends the Babylonians who conquer the bottom two tribes. But even then, he lets them come back. He still brings them back into the land. Time and time again, God gives them that chance. He does the same to us. Don't do this. Here's a way to avoid it. Don't do this. I'm giving you another chance. And we just say, ah, we want to do it anyway. That's the problem. We don't love the Lord our God with all our hearts, those kids of mine. We've been tempted by something we should have ignored, and we do things we should have. Just, do just get frustrated over something like that. Absolutely, no God has more power than the devil does. So we wonder why, why does God allow him to do this to me? I mean, that's what this simple attitude people have. And that is an answer. Why did God let Satan do this to me? And again, you're back to the question: What is it you did? Okay, I, I got a DUI ticket. Did Satan make you drink? I mean, literally, somebody tie you down on a bed. And with a funnel and pour it down your mouth? Well, no, God knows I'm tempted by alcohol. You couldn't find somebody else to go do something else with. You had to go to the bar. And then you had a designated driver, somebody who's willing to drive for you, and then they wanted to call you a cab. God didn't make you do that. You chose to avoid the consequences, to avoid the escape God gave you, and you did. Don't be blaming God because now you're sitting in jail. Having to pay ten thousand dollars to some lawyer to your license for a year and all that kind of stuff. God didn't make you do that. What were you? The How thing with you? addicts that kill me is that sorry, Mo, that any addict, and I don't care what it is, it could be pornography, it could be gambling, it could be drugs, alcohol, it doesn't matter. An addict, sex, whatever. All addicts, that is a decision of choice. Yeah. It, it is a disease of choice. It is. They start so if, if, if you have a disease of choice and you, first of all, don't own that it's a disease of choice, there's your first problem. It's not my fault. It's just way I made. It's a disease of made. choice. Yeah. So made those who are alcoholics and know it and then say, hey, I'm an alcoholic. I'm always going to be an alcoholic. I don't drink. We don't put the stumbling block in by offering them a drink. That's right. It doesn't don't. mean you can't drink. Right. But you it's don't a go disease of them. choice. When they stand in front of you and say, I'm making the choice not to drink. Because I have this disease, that's where you need to support that. You drink a soda. Yeah, yeah. But a lot that's of them, totally right. a lot of them, continue to make the wrong choice, even that's though right. all those things are there to stop them. All kinds of support. We saw that in our not a fan book last night. 
and I would accept that. You want to do dirty movies all the time. You want to quit, drive to quit, get married, still can't quit. You know, he finally kills his wife, still can't quit. He doesn't quit until he tries to kill himself and get into the hospital and he finds some organization they can go to and get counsel. He could have done that five years ago. But, but he wouldn't. He didn't want to because he really didn't want to quit. Right. And, you know, no question about it, drugs and even pornography and sex releases these endorphins or what they're called in your brain. It's, it's not easy. I mean, you get addicted to something. I used to bite my fingernails all the time. That's an addiction. I used to bite my nose until I stumbled along the way and said, God, I'm going to do this. I don't want to have some nails. Because I believe God gives you the power. If you want to do what God wants you to do, you can overcome any addiction you have. If you want to, he'll send you help. He'll help your mind work. He'll help you avoid these things. He'll give you friends who'll say it. I'll get so with you. Look like Emily. It's exactly like that. But you don't know all the lights, the yep. sounds, it's exciting, the change dropping. I mean, that, which is why that casino up there in Bristol is going to be a horrible thing for that community. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to bring tons of money into it, 99% of which the mafia and the illegal people are going to take out, and it's going to ruin a bunch of lives because people can't control their gambling industry. It's a horrible thing. Horrible, horrible thing. But it's there, and you got to live with it. If you've got a gambling addiction, you better have your nights filled up. You better have somebody willing to say, I'll sit with you. You know, you ever want to go gambling? You call me, I'll come get you, we'll go to the movie. You know, that's church family. That's what we're supposed to do. Someone who's tempted to go drink or gamble or whatever, and they know they can't. We should have every one of us should be saying, you can call me. You call me, I don't care what time it is, you call me and I'll come pick you up. You call me and we'll go do something together. That's what family does. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's one of those escapes from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God gave you a church family. Use them. Call on them. Tell them, I got a problem. I need some help. I need somebody to sit with me for two or three hours because I want to go gamble. And I can't afford the rent already. <laughs> but if I can go win one, one game, I can pay my rent. Those people are not in the business for you to win. And I don't give a hoot how many people they have on the TV like they did on the news last night. All these people coming out. Oh, man, I won this money. I got all this money. I won this money. They don't interview the 87,000 other people who lost every dime they were in anyway. Because that's not what they want to do. They want that cash cram full of people who believe they're going to strike it rich. And they're not going to strike it rich. You don't get rich in casinos. You lose your money, and that's why they're there. But that's we'll be on time. Sorry about that. Off my soapbox. <laughs> we'll pick up here next week, Lord willing. We'll keep touching on this. This is obviously a, a parable we need to talk about. Now, we didn't get very far today. We didn't get very far last time. I think it's something our church needs to hear. We need to hear. God's got a plan for us, and most of the time we miss it because we're not willing to count the cross. We're not willing to carry our cross because that's not fun. He wants to do that. All right? So I want to close this in prayer. Right, Teresa. Heavenly Father, thank you for the freedoms that we have to come and worship in your name and learn. Lord, thank you for Bob who is able to impart and help us, impart his wisdom and help us to learn the meaning of some of these things so that we can then apply them to our lives. Lord, bless each and every one of us that are here today. Give us our, the courage that only can come from you to reach out to others and bring them to Jesus. Help us to be able to say, let me talk to you about a man named Jesus, Lord. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.